Welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we focus on a recent book by Natalia Telepneva entitled Cold War Liberation, the Soviet Union and the Collapse of the Portuguese Empire in Africa, 1961 to 1971, published last June by the University of North Carolina Press. Our discussants this afternoon are Sergei Radchenko of Cardiff University and Daniela Richternova of King's College London. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University. I co-chair the Washington History Seminar with Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association that is focused on new scholarship over the past decade. Just a quick few FYIs before we get going. Please take note that the seminar will return in six days on Monday, May 8th, when we come back to discuss Georgetown University's Joseph Sassoon's new book, The Sassoon's, The Great Global Merchants and the Making of Empire. Second, as always, we like to recognize two people whose behind the scenes efforts make the seminar possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. Third, on the logistics front, Please note, today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And finally, when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll call on as many folks as we can. With those preliminaries out of the way, let's get this seminar fully underway. Christian Osterman is our moderator this afternoon. Christian, the screen is yours. Thanks, Eric. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce our featured speaker today, Professor Natalia Telepneva. She's a lecturer in international history at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. She is the author of the book we're going to talk about this afternoon, Cold War Liberation, the Soviet Union and the Collapse of the Portuguese Empire in Africa, 1961 to 1975. She has also published on Soviet and Czechoslovak intelligence for the International History Review and the Journal of Cold War Studies. She has co-edited the Warsaw Pact Intervention in the Third World, published in 2018. Natalia is a graduate of Columbia University and the London School of Economics. And she was a recipient of a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship from 2017 to 2020. With that, welcome to the Washington History Seminar, Natalia, once again, and the Zoom room is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Christian, for your kind introduction. Indeed, I will talk about my book called The Liberation, which basically tells the story of Soviet involvement in supporting so-called liberation movements in Portuguese colonies in Africa, that is in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. The story basically tells you about the colonial wars in these three Portuguese colonies, which lasted from roughly 1961 to 1974, when the revolution in Portugal led to quick Portuguese withdrawal from the colonies and to eventually to independence of Angola, Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau. So the book traces the role of the Soviet Union in that, those colonial wars and in the eventual collapse of the Portuguese empire in Africa. So just to give you a bit of a sense of where I'm going with it is that first I'll give you a little bit of context about Portuguese empire in Africa, especially for those of, of you who are maybe not familiar with that context, and then focus on some of the key findings from my research findings in the book. So to start with a little bit of context of Portuguese empire in Africa in the 20th century, since 1932, Portugal was led by an ultra-conservative dictator called Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, who believed that the colonies were crucial to Portugal's international standing and also really important to Portugal's economy as a source of raw materials for its industry. Portugal being one of the 
poorest European countries invested very little in its African colonies and practices such as forced labor in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau persisted right after the Second World War into the 1950s. It was also a system based on a racial hierarchy. The majority of the population in the colonies were deprived of citizenship rights. The only exception was made for a small minority of men and women of either multiracial descent or others who could prove to be Portuguese by fulfilling a certain, a certain criteria, by speaking a certain way, speaking Portuguese, adhering to certain cultural practices, and so on. This small group was called assimilados or the assimilated in the, in the context of the Portuguese empire. So in the book, and this is kind of where I start, because I focus a lot on individual people, individual stories of the people, both on the Soviets and the African side, I follow a group of revolutionaries from the Portuguese colonies who would come to dominate liberation struggles in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, and who would eventually come to power um, after um, after independence of, of these countries in 1974-75. To give you a bit of a context about these, this group of revolutionaries, they were mostly men, of me, men and women from assimilado or assimilated families who grew up in urban areas in the colonies during the interwar period. Some of them had a chance to study in Portugal after the Second World War, where many of them became involved in the anti underground anti-Salazarist movement, which was at the time in the 1950s, very much dominated by the Portuguese Communist Party, which was of course illegal under Salazar. Many of them also would become inspired by Marxist ideas and gradually come to the understanding that a violent armed struggle against the Portuguese in the colonies was inevitable. This group of, of African activists um, and revolutionaries spent most of the 1950s in exile, engaged in anti-colonial activism in places like, like Paris and Lisbon. But everything changed in 1961, when a major revolt against Portuguese colonialism in Angola led to a brutal military retaliation from Salazar, which in turn caused a major international scandal. So it was during this so-called Angolan uprising that the majority of African revolutionaries who started campaigning against Portuguese colonialism moved from Lisbon and Paris to African capitals so that they can start preparing for armed struggle against the Portuguese. Again, many of these men and women would set up so-called national liberation movements in African countries, oftentimes adjacent to the Portuguese colonies, for example, in Tanzania, in the Congo, uh, and uh, in Zambia, and many of them, those that I trace uh, in, in this book, would come to dominate anti-colonial struggles in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. It was also in 1961, this crucial year of the Angolan uprising, that the Soviet Union and some other Eastern European countries, socialist Eastern European countries, started providing cash, weapons, and military training to members of these uh, Lusophone liberation movements. Uh, so this is kind of the context of where the story starts. It starts really with uh, the move of some of these revolutionaries from the Portuguese colonies, uh, them moving back to African countries and preparing to launch armed struggle from there. So what are sort of the kind of key findings from the book? And uh, 
what 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 are some of the kind of key things that that we perhaps didn't pay attention to <laughs> on the soviet side because this is very much a book of international history that deals both with the soviets and the soviet actors but also with african african revolutionaries and african actors so on the soviet side the book shows and traces the, the role of what I called middle-level Soviet officials or международniki, internationalists, which was, I believe, a, a diverse group of Soviet area studies experts, international journalists, members of the intelligence services, and party bureaucrats who, by way of their expertise, personal connections would make important contributions to Soviet policy in Africa and Soviet relations with the liberation movements. I argue in this book that their Marxist worldview actually greatly influenced the way they interacted with the African clients and the way that they saw developments in Africa and developments within these liberation movements. In fact, some of them would become devoted during the course of their careers to the cause of African liberation and oftentimes lobbied for increased Soviet support for these liberation movements, oftentimes at kind of critical moments where their expertise would be, would be particularly required. It was also a group of these uh, Soviet middle range officials who were really important to Soviet cultural diplomacy in the third world and since the 1950s. These were the group of people who forged first contacts with African revolutionaries from the Portuguese colonies who started coming to events in the Soviet Union and other Eastern European countries and China in the 1950s as part of this kind of uh, new wave of trying to capture the hearts and minds of third world elites um, after, um, after the death of Joseph Stalin in the context of, of the thaw of the 1950s. So that's, that's one point that I'm trying to make throughout the book. Number two, I emphasize the role of African agency and regional African politics, which is often obscured, I believe, in generalized accounts of the Cold War. Major African cities like Dar es Salaam, Conakry, Cairo, Algiers, actually played a really big role in hosting these anti-colonial movements. These hubs and the politics of African governments of the African host states often played a really major role in determining the extent of Soviet support for liberation movements. And again, in the q and I can, I can tell you some of the examples how this was really important whenever the Soviets were kind of thinking of, of how to relate to their clients. So much of the book is devoted to explaining how these African revolutionaries navigated both local politics and internal rivalries. And all of these movements have major kind of internal rivalries and also had local rivals, whilst simultaneously pushing for support from international donors like the USSR or China but in this case, mainly USSR. So that's number two. Number three, uh, and another theme that I trace in this book is the militarization, what I call the militarization of Soviet support for the liberation movements. The context here, of course, is important because 1960s was a time when after the first wave of independence, many African countries experienced a string of military coups. And after, the, after these coups in Ghana, Mali, uh, 
And elsewhere, the Soviets became convinced that they had actually underestimated the role of the African military and intelligence services and doubled down on their attempts to strengthen the connections with the military and the security apparatuses of African states. This, of course, this kind of military relationship was also really crucial when we're talking about relations with the Lusophone liberation movements, because these movements, the MPLA in Angola, Free Limo in, in Mozambique, Paegise in Guinea-Bissau, all three of them waged guerrilla struggles against the Portuguese in Angola, Mozambique, and Bissau. So naturally, in a way, the Soviet military and military intelligence became increasingly involved in providing military training to the liberation movements, supplying them with weapons, and in discussions of military strategy. Well, you know, the first two seem self-explanatory. Actually, very few accounts have talked about military strategy and discussions of military strategy. Now, from the traces in the archive and from the documents that have become a little bit more available, uh, we can sort of trace the hints of these debates about military strategy going on in the 1960s and 1970s. And as these documents show, indeed, there were significant debates about military strategy, which involved the Africans, uh, the African revolutionaries, and also the Cubans who became actively involved in supporting these movements. So uh, one, one chapter in the book traces this kind of triangular relationship with, where the Soviets and the Cubans and the, and the African revolutionaries are discussing guerrilla, strategies of guerrilla warfare and ways to kind of overcome a certain... Um, difficulties in the war because the war in many of these colonies had stalled stalled in the early 1970s so it was kind of a hit and run kind of guerrilla warfare going on there what also i've i've seen is that the soviet intelligence both political intelligence the kgb and also the military intelligence the gru continued to have a highly pessimistic view of Western motivations in Africa all the way throughout, throughout a period of relative re relaxation of tensions between the Soviet Union and United States, this period known as detente in the early 1970s. And in fact, in the early 1970s, Soviet support, military support for the liberation movements increased uh, during the height of this relaxation of tension, the time, which shows that, you know, kind of policy in the third world and bigger Cold War was not necessarily uh, going on hand in hand. And this military support, for example, in the case of Guinea-Bissau, uh, was... Uh, was very important and military technology, Soviet military technology, which was used in Vietnam, but also would then be used in Guinea-Bissau, a small, small colony in West Africa, would prove, prove crucial to the, to the course of the anti-colonial campaign there. Again, I can, I can explore in the Q&A how that happened um, exactly. So that was my, my third point, um, the third, third theme that I explore throughout the book. And finally, uh, this book, and this is where I started, first of all, when I wanted to write this book, I wanted to understand the dynamics of Soviet involvement in Angola in 1974-75. So this book and the final chapter of this book slightly revises our understanding of how the Soviets became involved in the Angolan civil war. The story of 
Angola's descent into civil war and it becoming kind of a Cold War, classic Cold War hotspot after revolution in Portugal in 1974 um, is fairly well known. It has been described uh, in, in many, in many books and articles and so on. The basic context is that when revolution in Portugal uh, took place um, after a military coup in, nine, in April 1974, there emerged a kind of uh, power vacuum in Angola, which was Portugal's biggest and most important colonies. But in comparison to the other two cases, there existed three rival liberation movements, Angolan liberation movement, that had been vying for power in Angola since the early 1960s. And in the context of that uh, power vacuum, that competition between these rival groups really intensified in 1974. And despite a transition agreement, which was forged between them and the Portuguese government within a year of revolution, Angola descended in a full-blown out civil war. So this is the context that everybody knows, of course. Then in the historiography, there's existed a lot of misunderstandings about the role of the Soviets, especially versus the Cubans, who both got involved in support of the MPLA, a left-leaning Angolan liberation movement that the Soviets had been supporting since the 60s. So what we can see now from the available documents partly is to confirm what we knew before, that the Soviets saw developments in Portugal and Angola as interlinked, first of all, and also as part of international conspiracy to crush revolutionary developments, both in Portugal and in Angola. And as the Soviets believed, these efforts were led by the United States. In fact, and some evidence showed that the Soviets believed that the Americans became involved, heavily involved in Angola, even before they actually did become involved. So again, to highlight kind of some of their the worldview and how they saw events through this prism, oftentimes through a kind of ideological prism. At the same time, they were not too keen to become involved militarily in Angola. In fact, they thought that the Portuguese who stayed, who still stayed, the Portuguese army still stayed in Angola before independence, could maintain peace in the country. And it is only after some of these Soviet bureaucrats actually personally went, not bureaucrats, but also members of the intelligence services, went to Luanda and saw developments on the ground in a certain way that they really start to change their evaluation of whether peace would actually be possible, could be maintained before independence. But again, still throughout 1974, and uh, 1975, the Soviets preferred a so-called African solution. Actually, they used the term African solution to the Angolan problem uh, and pushed almost until the very last minute when the civil war was still already going on for some kind of agreement between these rival Angolan nationalist groups. Finally. What uh, we perhaps didn't know before, uh, the documents highlight the role of Soviet weapons in the initial stages of that conflict between the MPLA and their rivals in 1974-75. They actually show that the impact of Soviet weapons was quite profound during the initial battles for Luanda. Angola's capital city. And at the same time, documents also confirm the crucial importance of Cuba 
a bit later on in 1975, and the way that Fidel Castro blindsided Moscow in his decision to send actual troops uh, to, to Angola in support of the MPLA. So you know, the timeline provided by Pierre Iglesias and conflicting missions has been confirmed. So to, to sum up, some of the key themes from the book. I think the book on using this example of, of Soviet relations with the African liberation movements, Portuguese speaking, um, African uh, in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, it shows how ideology worked in practice, how it often shaped the views of African developments, how it shaped the Soviet views of African developments, and how it shaped the views and understandings of African clients and interlocutors. Again, I can I can bring in the QA can bring in some some of the examples to highlight uh, how how that affected them. Second, I think it brings to the fore sort of evolution of Soviet policy in Africa and the trend towards militarization of Soviet engagement, which is not completely new, but it kind of also shows how that, that militarization happened and, and why it happened in, in a way. And finally, the case of Angola, I think uh, brings some interesting detail about the dynamics of Soviet third world interventions, especially in the 70s, highlighting the importance of, on one hand, kind of Soviet men on the ground and the way that they processed and shaped information that would be going later up the chain to the, to the Soviet Central Committee and the leadership, and also local clients uh, not just you know the Cubans, but also local Angolan clients and African um, um, other African actors. Um, how that was also important in some of these in the dynamics of some of these interventions. So thank you very much. This is where I will end, and I'm very eager to to discuss this in uh, the discussion in the Q and A. Great, thank you, Natalia. Um, for this uh, great overview. Um, it's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce two wonderful leading experts we have to provide some initial comments and also questions. Um, uh, we'll start uh, today with uh, uh, Professor Sergei Rachenko. He's the Wilson E. Schmidt Distinguished Professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He has written extensively on the Cold War, nuclear history, on Russian and Chinese foreign policy and security policies. He has served, uh, we're proud to say, as a, a global fellow and to public policy, and I think uh, one of our senior fellow, um, whatever we call them, at the Wilson Center. Uh, and he has also been the Zhiyang uh, Distinguished Professor at East China Normal University in Shanghai. Uh, Professor Rachenko's books include include uh, Two Sons in the Heavens, The Sino-Soviet Struggle for Supremacy, published in 2009, and Unwanted Visionaries, the Soviet Failure in Asia, published in 2014. And he's working on his big next book we all are eagerly uh, awaiting to see, which will be terrific. He is a native of Sakhalin Island in Russia, was educated in the US, Hong Kong, and the UK where he received his PhD in 2005 before joining uh, SAIS. Um, he was, Sergei worked and lived in Mongolia, China, and Wales. Welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. Sergei, all yours. Gretchen, thank you very much for the super generous introduction. And uh, thank you all uh, for, for, well, thank you for hosting. Thank you, the Wilson Center. Uh, American Historical Association for hosting this uh, wonderful uh, book presentation by 
my uh, dear long time, long time friend and colleague Natalia Terepneva. Uh, I, 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 Natalia, if, uh, remember that moment uh, a few years ago was before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but uh, you and I were in the archives in Moscow. Uh, and 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 uh, things were opening it up. Remember the excitement that that both of us had as an oh my god, look at all this stuff, look at all this materials. We'll be able to rethink, reshape um, how how Moscow thought about the Cold War. And it is you know, at that time it was quite remarkable that they were releasing all these materials. It's still. It's still, I find it something is almost hard to believe that they actually opened this stuff up. Um, and remember, very few were actually there in that reading room. Uh, it was you, me, maybe, you know, people like Mark Kramer would also uh, show up there occasionally. So, um, uh, you know, these materials are were certainly underused, but I'm I'm so happy that you were able to get to this uh, this treasure trove of, of of materials on Soviet policy in Africa, which you used to such a great effect in this wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, I just wanted to congratulate you on this enormous success. You really enjoyed uh, the book very, very much. Uh, I hope this is going to be one of the... Uh, series of works that will emerge that will continue to uh, ongoing debates in a new cold war historiography i fear though now with russia's invasion of ukraine it's very difficult to predict what will happen to archives i know now archival access is much more difficult for those of us outside of russia so i think we we were we got the moment just right natalia when we were in Moscow uh, a number of years ago. But of course, the book doesn't just draw on the Russian archives. There's so much more here and interviews as well. It is really an integrated uh, work that 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 brings the best of uh, international Cold War scholarship methodology uh, in, in ways that is truly, truly uh, commendable. Um, uh, the key point, the key argument of the book, which Natalia presented very well in your uh, brief remarks, that is this, uh, the fact that this mid-ranking uh, officials were able to effectively drive uh, Soviet foreign policy in Africa, something that I find uh, at one level kind of perplexing, at one level really amazing because if you approach this question from the point of view of i don't know sort of the key big questions that are being asked by cold war historians well was it you know geopolitics or national interests or uh or ideology i mean you do talk about e all of those things you do talk about ideology in particular but you show how this process operates at the human level which is something that we uh often miss in those big uh, big debate, but it shouldn't be so surprising. Uh, when I was reading your book, I was I was actually reminded of the uh, work of uh, our colleague James Goldgeier, who back in the 1990s wrote a book, or was it only early 2000s, wrote a book about NATO enlargement and how there were policy entrepreneurs working within the White House, and he calls them policy entrepreneurs, who were pushing a particular kind of policy and were able to reshape, uh, you know, American approach to, let's say, you know, Eastern Europe. So in this sense, it shouldn't surprise us. Or to give you another example, during the uh, during the period of Russian imperial expansion into Central Asia in the 19th century, mid-19th century, it, it often was the case that the local actors on the ground were able to create empire where those people in St. Petersburg were not necessarily even aware of what's going on, or maybe they were aware, or simply they kind of followed just just you just just followed the advice of those who were making policy for them on the ground. So uh, I think the story that you tell about the Mishdunarodniki who were pursuing this policy and whose contacts with African revolutionaries play such a key role, it's both um, obviously interesting story for its own sake, but it also overlaps with many other things about how, you know, how we imagine foreign policy is done, many questions. Um, 
when I was listening to you now, and I was also when I was reading the book, I was asking myself um, big questions, those big questions about fundamental reasons for Soviet involvement in Africa, on which you touched. If you take the broad uh, view of what was Moscow doing in Africa, really from the beginning of the Cold War and then until the end of the Cold War, we can see that actually this policy was different. There are different periods and different policies. And it's for good reason that you start your book effectively in the early 1960s and follow, you know, and then also ends in the early 1970s. You don't really take a broader period because policy pursued by Moscow in the earlier period, for example, was very different. We know that Stalin, for example, had very little interest in matters African, certainly sub-Saharan Africa, so that's for good reason, because decolonization was not really happening in that part of the world just yet. But to the extent that he was interested in Africa, it is fascinating, for example, to see how he approached the question of, of, of Libya. He was trying to get a colony there, far from decolonizing um, Africa. He was actually trying to get a colony in Africa. I mean, this is Stalin for you, very much thinking in 19th century terms, you know, still carving up Africa, although, you know, kicking out all of those traditional empires, maybe carving it together with the United States. That's the idea, but he wasn't allowed. He wasn't able to get to the table and, and Libya remained out of Soviet control. But then comes Nikita Khrushchev and he's full of um, in enthusiasm for for Africa, as much as for Asia, of course, he starts his outreach to what we call the global south today, not with Africa, but as we know from, you know, with, with India, he goes to India, where does he go? Afghanistan, India, Burma, this is his first trip out there to show that Stalin was wrong to ignore those theaters and so on. Uh, and then, of course, Africa comes up as a big, big uh, factor in his uh, in his thinking. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the question for me is why was he doing this? Why was he so enthusiastic? Was it because he reconceptualized the Cold War as a true, truly global endeavor? And in that global endeavor, he thought that he required allies, no matter where they were, whether they were in Burma or you know, you know, Latin America or in Africa, indeed. Is this what made Africa so attractive to Khrushchev? Or what, were there other reasons, you know, geopolitical reasons? Um, uh, or, or something else, you know, when, when you talk about ideology and you do touch about, you know, you do touch on this question of ideology, do you see ideology as really the driving factor or is um, Cold War rivalry the driving factor here? Is it something about winning allies for Moscow uh, far away? Because Khrushchev, differently from Stalin, understood the Cold War as truly a global endeavor. So therefore, he needed those allies around, around the world. Um, here's the reason why I ask this. And again, looking at the big picture. If you take the Cold War out of this equation and say, okay, let's say we don't take the Cold War into account. Are there reasons why Moscow might be interested in Africa still outside imperatives or ideological imperatives of the Cold War? And we know today, for example, that Moscow is still interested in Africa and indeed is active in some of those same countries and even more countries than it was during the Cold War. You know, you have groups like Wagner going to Mali or Central African Republic or something like that or Sudan. Um, but the ideology is no longer there. Or is there some kind of other ideology? Is there another ideology that allows them to do that or that interests that? What is the driving force here? I wonder if you could say a few things about this. Finally, I know I've got, uh, uh, you know, my time is coming to an end and I don't want to Christian to mute me before <laughs> Uh, have the last thing that I wanted to say. You didn't say anything in your presentation about the Chinese role, although you do talk about it in the book. You do mention the Chinese question. I wonder if you can uh, highlight this because when we, you do, when when you say, you know, when you talk about Soviet preoccupation, their fixation on China, I think you're exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, 
Um, and I think that did actually uh, somehow also um, change uh, Soviet approach to to Africa as well. Final last question I had to say, or have to I have to um, quiz you about is this question of detente, and you touched again on this in your final remarks. Um, but okay, we know that the Americans had this idea that the Soviets were looking for detente. They were looking for a good relationship with the United States. And Kissinger, and this slightly takes us outside of your chronology, but Kissinger was so angry with the Soviet involvement in places like Angola because he could not understand what do they need in Angola, for God's sake, when we are trying to actually have a decent relationship with the Soviets. Uh, don't they understand uh, the impact on American domestic politics when it turns out that they're communist? The Cubans, the Cubans are in Angola doing all this, all, all those, you know, those revolutionary activities. Kissinger was really angry about it as we can see from the archival record. But when he raised this question with Brezhnev, Brezhnev basically kind of ignored him. You know, he ignored him. Why is it that Brezhnev did not, quote unquote, get the connection between detente on the other, on the one hand, and Soviet adventurism in the, in, in the global South or in Africa specifically on the other hand? Uh, let me offer my idea for this. And I wonder if you agree with me on this. My thinking is that for the Soviets, when they thought about Deton, they thought about equality with the United States. And for them, equality meant that, you know, they could have clients, they could have clients in Africa. And indeed, this is what made the Soviet Union an equal superpower. They could have clients just like the United States. If the United States was sponsoring kind of revolution, the Soviets could sponsor revolution. So in this sense, there was no contradiction between sponsoring revolutions in the, in the, in the third world and detente from the Soviet perspective. If this is, is this how you would see this? Uh, with this, uh, I'll, I'll shut up and uh, thank you very much again for your, uh, uh, for your book uh, and uh, for this tremendous presentation. Thank you, Sergey. Um, reviewed some of your, previewed some of uh, your next book there. So we'll see how it goes over before it's even published. Um, uh, Natalia, would you like to uh, respond to, I think it'd be nice to respond now to some of those questions and then we'll, uh, then we'll um, bring Daniela into the conversation. But um, uh, if you, you want to respond, now is the time. Yes, of course. Thank you, Sergey. Uh, these are, of course, really, really important and some major questions that uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think what when we're talking about the role of middle ranking officials in the Soviet policy in Africa, indeed, this is a point I underline. What we have to understand is that actually, I, I would say something that no also likes to likes to say, but Africa was not that important for the top Soviet leadership. And it you was know, throughout. The, the period and the, and the discussion in the book. And this is partly why these middle ranking officials, the Mezhnarodniki, often became more important in Soviet policy in Africa because the likes of Brezhnev especially, you know, didn't really understand or care much about uh, or understood the, the intricacies of Angolan local politics. That's why the people who really got it, who got those relationships, oftentimes could get their voices heard more so than uh, than in other kind of bigger aspects, uh, more important uh, more important policies like policies in the United States or relations with Western Europe, China, which the top Soviet leadership obviously cared much more about. So this is the kind of the, the bottom line you have to keep in mind. When we're talking about uh, China, the role of China and Maoism uh, in Africa, this is actually uh, an, an important aspect that I dedicate almost a whole chapter to and how it worked out. I think actually what I argue is, yes, the Soviets really did care about the Chinese challenge uh, in the third world, including in Africa, 
the context here is that the Ch China and the Chinese revolution was really popular among many African uh, revolutionaries and leaders who many of them went to China in the 50s and were very much impressed by the Great Leap Forward. Um, in fact, so there was a real challenge. And when I'm talking to, was talking to people who actually participated as uh, rank and file soldiers or officers in this guerrilla wars, they said, yes, you know, in the 1960s, I was a Maoist. I really, uh, you know, this is kind of the ideology that appealed to me. But what I argue is that uh, I think sometimes you can't explain everything all, all of Soviet policy with China. Because in certain, in certain areas and places like in East Africa, uh, the Chinese really had a really important role and influence and so on. So this is where they were always discussing and trying to understand who among the liberal African leaders was more or less pro-Chinese, so trying to figure it out, the Soviets. In other cases, uh, the China's kind of influence was less important, less pronounced. So other factors played into, into, into their thinking. That's why I'm saying you cannot uh, explain everything with the China factor. That's, that's what I'm arguing. Another thing, you have to understand local African developments and politics. Um, in the context of the Lusophone liberation movements, Maoism was on one hand attractive, on the other hand, it was problematic because the majority of these Af leadership of these liberation movements were of multiracial descent. And when the Chinese kind of defined anti imperialism in racial terms, that often was problematic for the leadership of these African liberation movements because many of the internal conflicts were around the issue of race. And say, so that's why uh, Maoism was often problematic for these movements that also had a lot of internal issues and struggles surrounding the issue of race and who leads the struggle, you know, can you lead the struggle uh, if you are a, a man or a woman of multiracial descent? And of course, you know, we're talking about the 1960s here where when the China was going through a cultural revolution where they on one hand kind of withdrew a little bit from, from actively supporting some of those movements, but also put a lot of strings attached to this to this support. So again, this was problematic from the perspective of liberation movements who uh, couldn't just reject Soviet aid. No. So, so that's why what I'm saying that the role of China is really important when we're trying to understand Soviet policy in, in Africa, but we have to look at very specific cases to see um, how they understood the challenge. And it was dis distinctive de depending on, on each case. Uh, when we are talking, um, you asked about this big question that everybody talks about, what would have, have happened without the Cold War, um, I think it wasn't about, about ideology, it wasn't about you know, what, what motivated Khrushchev's enthusiasm for Africa. I don't think that these two are necessarily mutually exclusive. I think, yes, on one hand, Khrushchev was uh, very keen to obtain new international allies, but also I think he really believed in the context of the thaw in peaceful competition between capitalism and socialism. And he was really determined and, and he believed that such competition was possible. And given the context that so many African leaders proclaimed kind of shared, uh, shared uh, disdain for capitalism, which they associated with exploitation, and colonial exploitation, imperialist exploitation, I think he believed that, in fact, a socialist system could be seen to be victorious, right? In, in only, and that it, they could compete peacefully with the West. So I think uh, his kind of ideological worldview 
shaped also the way he saw how to approach Africa. So if, if, that, if that makes uh, sense. When we're talking about what would have happened if Cold War was, wasn't there, I, I think definitely the Cold War uh, was, uh, was really important factor in the way that uh, the Soviets understood and approached, um, approached Africa overall. But I think, and this is kind of where I conclude, I think that debate about ultimately the goals of the Soviet Union and actually Russia in the world was never, never ended up until the, uh, the almost the collapse of uh, the, the USSR in 1991, there were some really heated debates among some of the kind of policy bubs, uh, some of the old kind of old Africa hands, if you can call it that way, of what is our place in in Africa, and what so so this this debate I don't think it was ever resolved. Of course, the Soviet policy evolved, and um, the enthusiasm of the nineteen early sixties was never matched later on, especially among many circles. And there were a lot of problems and a lot of disillusionment. But I think this debate about kind of Soviet and Russia's ultimate Russia's place in the world, one of its manifestations about policy in Africa kind of continued and the Soviet Union collapsed and it was kind of never resolved in a way. That's 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 kind of my thinking about this. And about the uh, why did Brezhnev? Why did Brezhnev ignore and didn't understand um, Kissinger's, or, or was it um, was it Nixon that uh, you were talking about when he when he raised Angola? I think because he actually believed that the Amer that ultimately his the Americans were hypocritical in the way that they approached the subject because, as as I mentioned, the Soviets actually believed that the Americans had intervened, had supported their own guys in Angola, right? So they could, they they were doing it. They This was a kind of international conspiracy. So why are they now raising this as an issue? So yeah, I guess your point about equality uh, makes sense, but I think it wasn't about all of us can have clients, but I think it's about, um, you are doing this already. We know you're doing this. You know you're doing exactly what we're doing. So why are you bringing this up as as a kind of a dramatic point? And ultimately, uh, fundamentally, I think the relax this this competition this uh, that they believed uh, was going on didn't have to end with the taunt and with the relaxation of tensions between the United States and um, and the Soviet Union. So this is this is where I see why this is what kind of the reaction that they got. Great. Well, I think we'll probably, uh, uh, we'll, we'll have further arguments on, on, on that issue, but I also don't think you're so far apart. Um, let me bring uh, Daniela into uh, the conversation. But actually, first, let me remind our audience that uh, there are a couple of ways uh, you can join the conversation uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, our preferred way is for you to hit the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be queued, and then uh, I will call on you, um, and you can put your question to the panel. Um, you can also use the Q&A function and write, post your um, uh, post your comment or question, and then I'll put them to uh, uh, to the speakers. But we really would love to hear your voice at least. Um, and so um, uh, join us, join us that way. Now um, it is my pleasure uh, uh, to introduce Dr. Daniela Ristolava, who is a senior lecturer in Intelligence Studies at the Department of War Studies, King's College in London. 
Her research and teaching focuses on the Cold War, on Cold War intelligence history, as well as contemporary issues related to intelligence, liaison, counterterrorism, intelligence, and intelligence analysis. Dr. Rithravar has presented her work at Harvard, Columbia, University of Cambridge, and the British Study Group, British Study Group in Intelligence, SGI. Uh, Daniela completed her Chancellor's funded PhD at the Politics and International Studies Department at the University of Warwick. She's a member of SGI Steering Committee, co-convener of the Cambridge Intelligence Seminar, and she teaches on the Cambridge Security Initiative a specialist course in international security and intelligence. She earned her MA degree at the War Studies in War Studies at King's College, pursued her undergraduate studies in politics and international relations at uh, Comenius University in Bratislava and NYU New York. Prior to her career in academia, Dr. Richterova worked as a research and analyst at the NATO Parliamentary Assembly in Brussels and later was head of Globsec, head of program of Globsec, the Bratislava Global Security Forum, an annual high-level conference on international security policy. She's published widely, including in International Affairs, International History Review, West European Politics. She's currently completing a monograph which explores communist Czechoslovakia's relationship with violent Middle Eastern non-state actors, including the PLO and Carlos the Jackal. And she is the series editor for intelligence, surveillance, and secret warfare for Edinburgh University Press. It's wonderful uh, uh, to have you with us. Welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Daniela, the Zoom room is all yours. Fire away. Thank you so much, Christian. I'm really sorry for the for that really long bio. I thought I sent a, a shorter one, but um, yeah, thank you very you much. Did, you did. You sent a much more modest bio, and I thought it was too modest, Daniela. So I upped it a little bit. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's great to be here. Um, thank you very much for hosting this, uh, Eric and Christian and, and, and your team. Um, and very many congratulations to Natasha, uh, much like Sergei, who was uh, clearly geeking out uh, with uh, Natasha over archives in Moscow. I spent some time doing that with, with Natasha with regards to Czechoslovak files. We've we've studied a lot of them. We've argued over some of them, what they mean, what they say, uh, whether this is the name of, of a particular institution or it's a different name. So we've kind of had our time with that. And so I think uh, it, it's wonderful to see the fruit of that labor um, really in Natasha's um, book. And and just like Sergey highlighted, not just basically um, this monograph being, being based on um, archival resources, but I remember when Natasha was getting ready for her voyage um, to Africa to interview uh, people and that that was that was quite quite a, a fascinating time for her I think and and you can really tell that um, that that also brings um, alive uh, not only um, not only the kind of kind of Soviet um, um, Soviet uh, bloc narrative but obviously the narrative of the national liberation movement so uh, very many congratulations for for um, writing such a great book um, that is so. Uh, kind of wholesome in its sources, but also that is a great read, by the way. You know, sometimes someone pe people write like really important books, but you're sitting here and you're thinking, wow, um, you know, I wish there was an editor who would kind of have ha have a little little go at this book. But uh, with your book, I felt like it read really nicely. So, so um, thank you for that as well. Um, now, I'd like to basically I have three points that I'd like to ask about, and these are all points that, that, that you kind of touch upon and make in the book, but I'd either like to push you on some of them or kind of um, ask you to maybe just tease them out so so people who maybe haven't read the book can also um, um, see these different angles to, to your arguments and to the story. Now, I won't be asking about China. Um, but I will be kind of riffing off of uh, so, so some of the points that Sergey made, and I'll be mostly asking um, about alliances and about security assistance, as that's kind of um, where my expertise um, uh, comes from. So first of all, when it comes to um, agency within the Soviet bloc, so I wonder if you, uh, looking at um, the Soviet Union, looking at Czechoslovakia, looking at East Germany and a couple of other players, 
Um, I wonder what this story tells us about the agency of, Slo uh, of, of Soviet allies um, or, or kind of the, so the Soviet Union and its allies um, uh, when it comes to providing security assistance. Um, and I wonder if um, the fact that Prague was, was first to, for instance, forge the clandestine relationship with the MPLA and Cabral, the result of like a de deliberate um, Soviet uh, policy or whether it was rather the result of um, Czechoslovak activism um, or uh, whether it was mixed um, uh, with kind of its, its small, uh, small state or small size um, status and the appeal of that, um, or whether it was because of kind of its arms dealing legacy, or whether it, it, it was purely by chance. I quite like how you bring out these specific um, and, and kind of micro stories of how Mr. Adamek was is, is is based there in Africa and is kind of doing his spiel. So I think I, I'd like you to elaborate on that. Like what um, what really made some of these Soviet bloc allies uh, stand out? Uh, which of these factors um, do you think uh, were key? Was it sometimes just happenstance that the right person was at the right time and forged the right alliance? Or was there a bigger kind of um, idea behind, um, you know, whether Czechoslovakia comes into this particular um, um, conflict or, or forges an alliance with this particular national liberation movement, or whether it's, an, it's a different Soviet ally. Now, the second thing I'd like to ask about um, are the po politics of alliances. And, and Sergei kind of alluded to this, to, to the kind of big macro uh, questions about the politics of alliances. So um, are these forged as a result of ideological ties, as, 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 as a result of geopolitics? I'd like to go to the more granule. Do you think that there were a kind of other factors that played a role in who um, kind of Moscow, Prague, or East Berlin uh, decided to support, which national liberation movements? And in particular, um, was it maybe the um, uh, kind of, kind of did, did the use of violence and how these, um, how these groups use violence and the type of violence that they use to pursue their political goals? Did you come across any debates about whether this mattered? Um, whether it mattered to to the to the Soviet Union and its allies, whether um, they pursued any kind of international um, kind of uh, violent campaigns, such as the one that you mentioned, the hijacking of Santa Maria cruise liner, like did that in any way impact Moscow's uh, want to support these groups? Um, and I also wonder if the personality, and you you touch upon this obviously, but I, I just wanted to tease tease that out a little bit. Um, what role did the person personality of the individual uh, leaders of the groups um, play. Um, do you see that, that, that their ability to really forge ties with states and to go to international conferences, um, hang out with diplomats, um, you know, hold long discussions with, with Soviet bloc spies, like did that impact um, whether they got the support or not? Um, and then the third question uh, would be about kind of training content and, and doctrine. And you mentioned doctrine a little bit in your introduction, uh, but I was wondering if you notice any um, kind of key differences between uh, training doctrines and kind of the content of training across um, the various uh, security assistance providers, um, be China, the USSR, Czechoslovakia. Um, is there any difference uh, or or I, I'm assuming there is. Um, so, what what are the kind of key differences there? I think you mentioned quite a few of them in 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 the book. And also, was there competition between these security service providers? Did you come across any any of these kind of testy debates where, you know, one one country is kind of envious of what the other one is doing, or upset that they got there first, or upset that they are doing a particular type of um, training? Um, and just one last kind of specific question about Cabral. Um, I was wondering um, why there was this, this shift in um, Prague's uh, security provision to Cabral's men, because you mentioned this, that, that, that at, at first they provided Cabral with uh, guerrilla and kind of sabotage training, and that later this was restricted to counterintelligence, mostly if I remember correctly. Um, so, so was this because someone else took over? 
um, that training or because they've just completed that training and they didn't need it anymore? Um, did you find um, why this shift occurred? But overall, thank you so much for this. I think this is, a, again, a great read for anyone who hasn't bought the book. So if you haven't, please run um, outside your house the moment this finishes. And if you're not in the UK where it's almost midnight um, and go and buy this book. So thank you, Natasha. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Yeah, again, these are really excellent questions. I think the starting point here is that whenever we're talking about any issues to do with military or military issues or security assistance, assistance in this context, we have to know that our knowledge is still very limited and that we do not know a lot or we know we, we, know we do not know a lot about how things worked, especially between um, different, uh, when it comes to specific case, cases, case studies, um, and um, actors and partners in the third world. Uh, what I can, so based, what I'm gonna say is only based on my fairly, on, on my observations and understanding based on the source material that's still quite limited because when there is a lot of material and actually incredible materials available from on the security side and intelligence from Czechoslovak uh, archives uh, that you mentioned, Daniela. But of course, we still don't have anything um, on the Soviet side, <clears throat> with the exception of these kind of big overarching reports by the KGB or the GRU that, Sergey, you mentioned. In, in the or kind of you mentioned you alluded to that there's been this kind of declassification, limited declassification of these files, and you can get to some of these GRU or KGB reports. But of course, on the Soviet sides, we do not have access to um to details of any covert operations uh, or any extensive details about military training. Um, and and so on. So we, we have to look, there are crumbs in the archives, but we do not have the full story. What I can what, what I can say about agency, from what I've gathered, I think that Eastern European socialist countries did have a lot of agency when it came to policy in, in Africa. Czechoslovakia, of course, is an important case study here. I think Czechoslovakia got involved for uh, partly economic reasons, but also for political reasons, because in the, in the late 1950s, because they wanted to have this role in the third world, and there were certain people like the Ministry of Interior, Barack, who wanted to kind of carve for himself a role um, in um kind of in, in, in the leadership to kind of show, you know, his, um, so that's why Czechoslovakia in particular became really, really active in Africa uh, in uh, starting from the late 1950s. So of course they were selling arms, but also they were training people, they were providing security training. So from what I can gather, they definitely had a lot of agency, even though the coordination did exist when it came to joint operation, intelligence operations in the third world. Um, and clearly there was some also coordination between the local intelligence stations on the ground. I think the Czechoslovaks uh, did have a big role and agency when it came to uh, to policy. So I think, you know, when we when we, if we look at comparison, some other countries like Poland, right, managed to avoid almost entirely getting pulled into supporting or providing humanitarian aid to some African countries. So I think um, after 1956, there was a lot of room for maneuver and um, and 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 these this this Eastern European countries had had their own agency and a role to play. And of course, Czechoslovakia was really important uh, provider of security and military assistance to uh, Milker Cabral and the movement PGC. Um, so, 
and, and again, for, for, for the sorts of reasons that, that I describe in the book. When it comes to the politics of alliances and the use of violence, I think this is your alluding to a bigger debate uh, about the transition to violence with the African National Congress. Of course, there have been different views about the Soviet role in the decisions, a decision of the NC to launch armed struggle and create Mkonto with Sizwe. Um, again, there are a lot of debates in there. What was the Soviet role? I think in the case of the Portuguese uh, liberation movements, the decision to begin armed struggle was their own. You know, the Soviets definitely didn't dictate them to proceed to armed struggle. Uh, there is no evidence for that um, on one hand. Uh, so, but at the same time, um, there is little we know about this issue when it comes to the Soviet Soviet archives. Um, we know from the Czechoslovak files that the Czechoslovaks wanted, say, the PGC to proceed much quicker to armed struggle because they were afraid that other local rivals would then, would then uh, overwhelm or take, take center stage. So I think uh, this is a, a, an interesting, complicated picture that emerges in each particular case. Um, so um, th this, is, this is something that, uh, that still we don't know the full story, but there is no evidence that you know, this was at all Soviet diktat. Uh, clearly, this was decision on behalf of the African liberation movements to launch armed struggle because of internal reasons and the reasons that the Portuguese were not willing to negotiate. So that's the fundamental one. And came to personality. Yes, I talk a lot about personality in the book uh, quite extensively. Personality made a huge deal. And out of the three liberation movements, uh, Angola, Mozambique, and then Guinea-Bissau and, and Cape Verde, uh, Amilcar Cabral, who was the leader of the PAIGC, the movement for independence of Guinea, Bissau, and Cape Verde, he was in a way the most favorite. He was uh, the, the favorite of Moscow because partly because mainly because of the kind of man he was, because of his diplomatic skill, his willingness and his ability to charm oftentimes his Soviet interlocutors. His movement actually received cons very consistent support from the Soviet Union and proportional terms, greater support than the other two. And of course, again, going back to ideology it did help that he was somebody who, um, who shared uh, certain tenets of Marxist thought, at least the understanding of history. He was somebody who was quite critical of African socialism. He was talking often about Soviet-style scientific socialism, the kind of ideology he preferred, but his personality played a huge role. When it comes to the training doctrine um, and the training doctrine, different training between different security providers, uh, I think the story hasn't been fully written yet. I think we do know that all social countries, they use the experience of the partisans in the Second World War uh, to, to kind of teach uh, African revolutionaries how to wage armed struggle with oftentimes some of the, some of this made sense, some of that was didn't fully make sense and um, for example, when I was speaking to the military who went through training the Soviet Union, some of them said, well, yes, we really appreciated being taught how to fire arms, certain arms we needed, but certain aspects of this training, for example, how to orientate in the snow or how to look at, track certain um, electricity lines didn't make sense in the context of Guinea-Bissau. So, but they, they did appreciate kind of the training in weapons and so on. 
Uh, but I think uh, I don't fully know the, the full answer to your story, whether the training doctrine really differed or where there were a lot of similarities. I would say there were probably a lot of similarities in the way that they approached these things. Of course, always bringing to the fore their own national examples about, uh, about the fight against Nazism during, during the Second World War and so on. <clears throat> um so that's that's where i would i would end in answering your questions thank you. great thank you um and thank you daniela for those um thoughtful questions let's um ask some questions too but let's first bring in some of our um patient uh viewers um kent hughes kent hughes you're first if you please unmute yourself Oh, okay. He's no longer no longer has his, his hand up. Then we'll go to Tony Carroll. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Tony Carroll. I, for about 10 years, have been an adjunct at SAIS um, in the African Studies Program. And in uh, 1992, I was one of the leaders of the IFES election observing delegation to the Angola elections. Uh, on my uh, election team were uh, John Markham and uh, Jerry Bender. So I certainly got a lot of grounding on Portuguese Angolan uh, history through my uh, many, many long discussions with them, and including a long evening when Holden Roberto, where John recanted, retold the story about the battle for Luanda, which uh, I can tell at another time. But my question is, looking at it from an African lens, uh, my question to the, to the author, and I look forward to reading your book, is to what extent the Soviet relations with those countries that were supporting uh, Savimbi that weren't really Maoist, but were really more aligned with Felix Ufoy Bonnier's, Leopold Segnor, Kenneth Kaunda's attitude toward negritude about the idea of not necessarily supporting the Assimilado movement, which obviously the MPLA represented largely. And I'm wondering what the pushback might have been with Soviet relations with those countries uh, as a result of their sort of differing views on who to support in the Angola campaign. I'm not an expert on Guinea-Bissau. I've been to Mozambique a few times, but my my real interest is in the Angola uh, uh, situation. So thank you very much. I look forward to getting your book. Should I, should I respond? Yep, yeah, please do, and succinctly. Uh, Soviet uh, relations have been actually quite fascinating. I think uh, basically Soviet attitude towards MPLA and NATO was often, was throughout this period, very, very pessimistic and quite problematic. Yes, they supported the MPLA, but also throughout this period and even after independence, they believed that the MPLA wasn't representative enough. And even though, of course, they didn't have much faith in Holm Roberto, they did want um actually for NATO to have some kind of alliance with Savimbi. And that kind of dynamic, I think, continued in a way after independence, where, again, I think the Soviets believed that the MPLA should uh, should become more representative, especially they, they didn't like the kind of the Mestizo uh, leadership. Uh, of course, my book ends in 1974-75, and you are asking about the periods, like you know, you're alluding to the period of the of the war that continued after independence. Uh, of course, uh, you know, they continued supporting the MPLA. We know that, uh, and uh, when it comes to countries as Savondi Savimbi, like Zambia, um, I mean, they tried to kind of persuade them. To not to not do that, and I think uh, basically when so many countries started, uh, African countries including um, recognizing the MPLA government, uh, kind of the Zambians were left a little bit uh, in a kind of a problematic position, at least initially. So um, I'm not sure I uh, fully uh, answered your question. But um, you're asking about the period, which is obviously a little bit later where the book ends. Um, so, yeah, this is um, this is kind of my general gist on the MPLA. But it was it's a very complicated 
uh, relationship between the Soviets and the MPLA, and there were lots and lots of com conflicts uh, with NATO and um, and Lucia Lara and so on. Thank you. Ken Hughes has resurrected his his raised hand, so let's go to him, Ken. There we go. Uh, thank you for a terrific description of a book that I'm going to have to read. In the late 60s, there was a Brazilian book published called The Invasion, or Invasão, and they talked about the prospects for invading Angola. Did Brazil play any role in the period you're describing? Uh, it's funny you're, you're asking this because actually until recently nothing was known about Brazil, but now some people are writing about the Brazilian involvement here. Well, on one hand, there was the influence of the Brazilian Communist Party, which actually influenced the likes of the MPLA leadership, you know, kind of left winning from the 1950s because there was a lot of transatlantic exchange and exchange of publications and leaflets. Not sure if this is called Brazil, but Brazilian communism played a role in a way, not just Portuguese communism, um, into some of the ideas of some of these Angolan revolutionaries. But what's in, in, interesting is that well, there were actually actors all across Latin America that saw the collapse of Portuguese empire um, in a very, very negative light. And I'm actually putting together a, a volume that uh, and some some of the some of the new authors are talking about this so-called networks of the right wing actors, including in Brazil, who forged connections with the conservative right wing uh, in among the Portuguese military and also South Africa, who uh, tried basically to help. Uh, the anti-MPLA uh, elements um, in um, in Angola and elsewhere in Africa. So yes, basically there were transatlantic links between conservative uh, military actors, um, you know, the Brazilian the Brazilian military dictatorship and other uh, Latin American dictatorships and their counterparts, for lack of a better better term especially in apartheid uh, South Africa. Thank you. Jared Huber is next. Hey, Let's go ahead. Yep. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I want to say I love the book. I, I've read it twice and when I TA, I recommend it. Um, I'm, I'm a graduate student. I'm getting ready to start my PhD at UT Austin in the fall. I wanted to know, um, I've noticed looking through American documents that there seems to be a pretty distinct interpretation and U.S. intelligence of the Portuguese empire in kind of two halves, that being Africa and then maybe the Orient, you'd call it. Does this come up in Soviet intelligence, the Soviet intelligence apparatus, or in the communist bloc, have you seen? Uh, what do you mean, two two halves, you mean Orient? What, 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 do you refer, what are they referring to? Um, generally, the Portuguese imperial project in Africa the, port, the African colonies vis-a-vis -vis the different parts of Portuguese, India, Timor-Leste, and Macau. Right. Uh, well, actually, I've personally not come across uh, come across any uh, any kind of discussion uh, of um, of of that uh, in specific. But again, uh, you have to understand that the record we have is very incomplete, and um, so so no and again we know very little about uh ab about actually soviet relations with the portuguese military um even though of course you did have because what happened in portugal in 1974 75 um uh, it's very likely that the soviets did have contacts among the portuguese military but again, uh, we don't know. We don't know much about. Or we don't know anything really about that. Uh, and um, again, there is there is very little uh, that I've seen discussions right. about the Portuguese intelligence or the military in that context. All right, let's go to Marina Ottaway next, and then to Intercom. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it's not very nice, uh, David. It's uh, Dave Ottawa. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was a journalist for the Washington Post and covered the battle for Luanda, uh, spent weeks there. And uh, I was, you start, the, the group that seemed to have a, a really crucial role were the Portuguese communists. They were the ones that provided the intelligence and the logistics and uh, advised uh, the MPLA and how to chase Ro Holden Roberto's soldiers out of Luanda. And uh, I'm curious what relationship you found between the Soviets and the Portuguese communists in uh, working together or not working together in helping the MPLA uh, achieve its victory. Yeah, well, we know that uh, already before that the MPLA and Agostinho Neto had uh, contacts within, uh, well, obviously, with the Portuguese Communist Party, we know with Alvaro Cunhal, was really important um, interlocutor between him and the Soviets. He, Cunhal, personally saved Neto, kind of in relation with the Soviets uh, at certain crucial times. But when it comes to the military aspects, I would highlight uh, the role of the uh, the armed forces movement, right, who took over and especially the left wing members of the armed forces movement who took over in Portugal in 1974-75. We know that the likes of Rosa Coutinho in Angola provided extensive support to the, um, to the MPLA. But what I've discovered in the documents is that Neto boasted and highlighted his relationship with the Portuguese military, the armed forces movement, to basically convince the Soviets to provide, to, to resume support to the MPLA, military support to the MPLA in 1974-75. And he actually described the series of secret meetings with the Portuguese military, where allegedly, according to NATO, uh, he was promised to become, uh, to become the new president of Angola, and this is kind of how he shaped these uh, these conversations with the Soviets, uh, basically saying the Portuguese they'd rather want uh, the MPLA and keep that relationship and keep a certain economic stake in Angola than allow Holden Roberto and the Americans to come in and replace them very easily. Uh, so that's kind of how he drew that in. So this is a very interesting aspect. Again, I can't confirm like the full extent of these clandestine meetings he was talking about NATO, but that's how he presented, he pitched why the Soviets should resume. Uh, it was a complicated episode where the Soviets had stopped their support for the MPLA. That's how he pitched to the Soviets to resume military supplies to the MPLA by leveraging his relationship with the armed forces movement. Thank you. Uh, Inter Kong. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Oh, thank you so much. Well, my name is Inter Kong and I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. Um, I just have a two question. I think these are quite off topic questions, I think. But the first one is about, um, so uh, besides this military involvement of uh, the Soviet Union in, the, in Angola, um, just curious to hear uh, whether uh, the economic and also cultural interest or interaction between two countries also continued even after like uh, the year of 1975. And the second question is about uh, if you could uh, just, I'm just kind of wondering whether you could tell us a little bit about, um, a little bit more about this personal profiles of this mid middle ranking members of the Soviet bureaucracy, especially their um, kind of educational background. Uh, just wanted to hear about them. But of course, I'm pretty sure that your book will pr probably have a lot of information on that. So thank you in advance. Really briefly. Yeah, no, in, in true, in, indeed, I, I dedicate a whole chapter trying to explain the, the backgrounds and uh, worldview of some of these people. Some of them were uh, 
uh, older generations who had career, started careers during the 1920s, 30s in the communist internationals. Our, others were young people who had uh, came of age during the Second World War. So they were veterans of the Second World War, um, different educational backgrounds, mainly quite prestigious. Uh, prestigiously educated, new languages and so on, kind of had a sense of pride in their country after the Second World War. So this is kind of the, the general gist here. And it came to Soviet relations with these Portuguese, uh, you know, Angola, Mozambique, and Bissau. Yes, of course, there, um, there was extensive uh, cooperation in economic, political, and, of course, military spheres after independence. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it here. There are several people who have their hands up, um, and I know there are more people in the Q and A. Um, but I'm afraid um, uh, we like to bring this to an end. Um, I think uh, four of the um, five panelists here are on European time, so it's quite late. I think uh, we'll we'll end this here. My thanks, um, of course, to Natalia, to Daniela, and to Sergey and Eric uh, for a really terrific uh, roundtable. And I'll turn it over to Eric for final remarks. And my thanks as well to our panelists and to Christian uh, and to all of you uh, in the audience. Please join us next week on Monday, May 8th at 4 p.m. Uh, at Eastern Daylight Time for a discussion of the Sassoons, the great global merchants, and the making of empire. Till then. Stay safe. Good night.